when I walked out here, I got to be honest, I was pretty nervous. I hope I didn't, you know, bomb this. <laughs> you know, because last time what happened? So on the screen, you were going to see my best friend, my wife, Kelsey. She winds up uh, telling me with excitement and fear that she's pregnant. Nine months go by and my daughter's born. And the reason I know that my wife is the best in the world is because when I looked at my wife and I said, what do you want to name her? You think Madison or Avery? She looked at me and said, no, we have to name her Chloe Lynn, don't we? And I said, we don't have to do that. Why would you even think that? And she said, because you idiot. You already got your ex-girlfriend's name tattooed on your arm. <laughs> yeah. So we named her after my ex-girlfriend. <laughs> it's not true. It's not true. No, my ex-girlfriend's the devil, but it's on. So everything's going my way. I'm coming up with my third deployment. I got to go over to Afghanistan for my third time. Start putting our stuff on like normal. As we're going over what we're going to do, we're strapping our gear on. We go out with the minesweeper and we start sweeping the ground back and forth. Back and forth. Nothing alarms us or anything there. I take my backpack off and I set it on the ground. It hits the ground and underneath it is a bomb. And it takes my right arm, right leg automatically. They rush me into surgery, right? We're going to fast forward into the surgery here. And they cut my left leg off because it's already gone. And then two days later, they have to cut my left arm off because the skin and neck are tied. So I'm a quadruple amputee. Three days later, I arrived at Walter Reed in Bethesda, Maryland. My wife came up to me, right? And I saw her. And when I finally got the chance to talk to her, I said, Kelsey, you don't have to do this. Take the house, take the cars, take whatever money we have saved up and go. This is not the life I would choose for you. And she thought about it, and she said, you know, I was thinking that. Yeah. Yeah. And then she came around, and she said, you know what? Handicap parking sounds enticing. I'm, I'm going to stay. But if you can imagine, she actually, at 23, and I'm 25, and our daughter's six months old, said, you know what? I'm going to be here. We're going to get through this together. So I'm at Walter Reed, and I'm trying to recover. I had to find motivation. But I find motivation in my wife and my daughter. And all of a sudden, there's a brotherhood at Walter Reed. A robot walked into my room. And the first thing out of this guy's mouth was, hey, man, welcome to the club. I said, I don't want to be in your club. He said, kind of late now, don't you think? I said, oh, you got me there. And his name was Todd Nicely. He showed me that with hard work and determination, I could walk again. And two things went off. Number one, this guy showed me the way that I can get better. I can still be there for my family. And number two, he's a Marine. And if a Marine can do it with how dumb they are, you know. So the things I wanted to accomplish, I wanted to be able to feed myself again. I wanted to be able to pick a fork up and put food in my mouth. You see, I, I couldn't do that for five weeks. At five weeks, I was out of my recovery stage enough where I was healed up and I could grab a fork. I also was tired of sitting in a wheelchair. I thought, you know what, I want to be able to walk again. So seven weeks and four days into my recovery, I took my very first steps at Walter Reed. It was very painful. It was not easy. And as I was walking around the track, they said, you'll walk one lap today. And I went ahead and walked three laps that day. And when I got done, I sat down, took a breather, and realized this could be something that I do. Now the next thing, ladies and gentlemen, is my hand. Now, this thing's the coolest thing in the world. On the screen, you're going to see the most important hand that I own right there. It's not the one I'm wearing. No, that one. That one's called a Greifer. That hand is in a Crown Royal bag on the top shelf of my closet. Yeah. And nobody touches that hand because that hand closes 25 pounds of pressure. And you see, my daughter is seven years old. Yeah, in nine years, Johnny's going to come knocking at the door. And he's going to be like, hey, bro. I'm like, did you just bro me, Johnny? That's 25 pounds of pressure. He's like, ah, oh, dude, that hurts. Johnny, there's no strike two and three. This is two and three right here. Crunch. I break his hand. I know, sad. He's like, let me go. Let me go. I pull Johnny close. I don't let him go. No. I say, Johnny, guess what? I don't know what. No fingerprints, Johnny. Remember that, Johnny. When I got blown up and I was down and out and I was wondering why did this happen, I was embarrassed, I was angry, I was questioning am I a bad person, does God hate me? And the biggest question I honestly had, ladies and gentlemen, was why didn't I just die? Why did I live through this? And I found the answer in my family. And I found the answer in Todd Nicely, that corporal that came to see me that was retired from the Marine Corps, that told me I would be fine. So I decided I was going to talk to everybody I could that was at that hospital. And at Walter Reed, amputees are what you normally see. 
And me missing all four limbs, that was the worst you were going to see. So I'd go room to room. And I'd say, hey, I'm Travis. You're going to be fine. Same message Todd gave me from that experience. Some people found out I did that. I became known as the mayor of Building 62. And they made a documentary on me. I don't think my problems outweigh anybody else's. I am fortunate to live in a nation where I can wake up in the morning with no arms and no legs, strap my legs on, right, throw my arm on, go in the elevator and go out and live life to the fullest. Take my wife and my daughter wherever we want to go. The two life lessons that I have learned that I want you to go and pass along to everybody that you meet is number one, don't dwell on the past. I learned that because when I was sitting in my hospital bed, closing my eyes and wishing that this did not happen, I realized you're not going to change the past. I can't change what happened yesterday and I can't change what happened six years ago in Afghanistan. So I reminisce the 25 great years I had with legs and arms and I've had six pretty great years without them. But with that experience and so many more, you can't always control your situation but I can always control my attitude.